Hi, my name is Frida Weisel and we are here in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, New York, where we find an extraordinary economic story. In most of the world, the small business owner has been mostly pushed out by mega corporations which are able to drive down prices and conquer markets and then are able to turn most business owners into employees. We've seen over uh, the larger economy that move away from a local shopkeeper industry, except in this community, there are shopkeepers everywhere. The entire main street is full of mom and pop shops. Why? Because the community has very specific needs that can be met by McDonald's. McDonald's isn't kosher. The community needs specific clothing. They, there's a need for specific entertainment. All of these create markets that can be satisfied by mega corporations and therefore provide opportunities for small businesses to operate within this community. So I want to show you some of the shopkeepers, what they sell and how these reflect a larger chain of items that are being sold and produced and manufactured and provide the economic underbelly of this community. Here we are inside the grocery store and we have aisles and shelves and shelves of ordinary items, coffee and tuna that all are very specifically made by companies that service this community. The tuna fish that is being sold here is not the tuna fish that you'll find in a regular stop and shop because this has to be kosher in order to make sure that they've been produced in accordance with the kosher laws. All of these food items and there are aisles and aisles in each grocery store provide a market and there are many many companies from Gayfen to Dagim that are serving this niche of creating parallel versions of the foods you'll find in regular markets but all of these are produced with a supervision of a rabbi to make sure that it's kosher. There are very many of the chips that might be familiar to you, tortilla chips, potato chips, but they're not wise, they're not lays, they are kosher and they are produced by the local companies but more so they are um, have absolutely no cheese in them there is no sour cream and onion flavor there's no cheddar cheese flavors because those provide a problem with regards to the meat and dairy laws so in order to simplify that the chips that the companies for this community create have none of that so it's it's not just that we've taken the wise chips and packaged them with a pashkas and a kosher supervision there have been they've been modified in order to make sure that they make sense for the community's kosher laws a Hasidic Yiddish newspaper stand. In general, in the larger world, newspaper stands are going extinct as most of the news goes online and most of the news conglomerates have been concentrating under a select few large uh, corporations that own them. In the Hasidic community, we can't have a New York Times. There is no New York Times in the newspaper because the New York Times is not kosher. The need for censorship and for a very specific kind of messaging creates uh, a, a vacuum in which the community's own media creators are able to step in and create their own businesses. This is a Yiddish newspaper, Der Blatt, that is filled with advertisements, which of course are a source of revenue to the companies. They also, besides telling the news, will have a classified ads, which again is a source of revenue in a way to communicate to the community and something that would otherwise not be needed if the whole community was online. So the fact that people don't have online makes the newspaper so much more a central and vital part of the Hasidic community's diet of information. And it allows for the advertisements to carry so much more weight and also therefore to have much more economic value. All of these you pay for. You buy the Bina, which is for women, and the women's magazines usually have pictures of salads or soup or, or a nice sofa. Um, as you can see for Hanukkah because you're not supposed to show pictures of people and then there's the males. It's, the magazine is gender, sort of gendered. This is a male magazine which has a lot of stories about Rebus and then there's children's stories. A lot of this community's uh, 
fair that's available for sale is going to be male, female, and children, these three categories, again, which don't translate to the secular categories. And then there's also the freebies, which is something like this. You can just take them and they have all sorts of classifieds. Again, this would not be able to exist if the internet was competing for this community's market, but because the internet is forbidden in the home, these are very, very busy industry. There's in fact different people making these and they cover their funds by having advertisements and classifieds and then they make themselves needed to the community by announcing engagements, weddings, and sometimes births and so on. So let's check out the candy store. It's before Hanukkah, so all of the candy that's sold here is again kosher, is specifically made kosher, but also in accordance to what the community's life cycle and um, celebratory needs are. So this says Happy Hanukkah. It's from start to finish this way. Kosher candy with a kosher symbol. We have Nutty Chews. We have Kifkop. This is the Kit Kat, we have Smirk, which I'm pretty sure is Snickers, Milk Munch, which is a Milky Way. And this I'm not sure what it's called in the brand version, but all of these are off-brand Pashkas. They're, they're sort of deviations, they're adaptations uh, for kosher. And, um, and Pashkas is a local company that serves this community. Hushkis would never be able to have the business they do if the people in this community didn't need to have a specific kind of Snickers, a Snickers that has the kosher symbols on it that has been supervised by a rabbi. So the kosher needs creates the market that is then filled by a vast number of companies that step in. So this candy store is not only a local shop. It is also selling locally manufactured and distributed items uh, in accordance to the community's needs. You'll find a lot of silver and jewelry in the main street that serve the community's needs, less so uh, massages and nail salons and hair salons and other beauty and self-care products. You can really tell by the kinds of shops there are, even if they aren't specifically kosher, that they revolve around the religious traditional life, the domestic life, rather than the self-care uh, of Western modern society. So we have all of these beautiful pieces of silver that are on sale here. Usually they have a role in the religious life. The jewelry shops sell jewelry that are specifically a part of the gifting cycle of for instance, you get engaged, the first gift you usually get is a, a bracelet, a diamond bracelet. Uh, upon the engagement party, you get a diamond ring. On the day of the wedding, the groom gifts the bride diamond earrings. So the jewelry shops will have a large ensemble of these items. Here is a beautiful uh, shirt shop for the Hasidic community, and as you can see, there's a large variety of white shirts and white shirts on sale for you to pick from. This is, this is beautiful shirts that are limited. The selection is curated in its limited uh, styles and options for the men who only wear white shirts under their three-piece suit. This is the B110 we're on. As you can see, this bus does not allow you to pay with the New York City Metro card. You have to pay with money outside of that. Even though this bus is a very unique story, the B110 bus is an MTA New York City bus stop that is operated by a private company within this community. And again, the reason the community is able to have a private busing company where elsewhere this would not be imaginable is that there are specific needs in the community to go between different enclaves without stopping in between, as well as for men and women to sit separately. So this bus, the men usually sit in the front and the women sit in the back. And this gender segregation, again, is, is the specific needs that creates the economic opportunity. 
Let's take a look at the toy store. The toys here are starkly um, limited in that you don't see for sale really the entire princess industry, the Barbie industry that's very limited um, or, or imitations, no, no dolls with uh, sexualized figurines. You don't see minions or any of the Disney and, and movie characters, no superheroes, the concept of the superhero doesn't exist. Rather, the toys serve to reflect the values that the children hold dear and that they aspire to, which is around the family. So there are a lot of children's toys that are created specifically for this community, introducing the children to family values and all of the different toys that reflect marriage, the, the characters that reflect married life, the bride character, the babies, the life cycles, all of these characters from the Shabbos table to the wedding are very much uh, reflecting what the children hold dear. But then there are also generally American games and entertainments, regular games that are translated as well as have new values imparted on them. So instead of a regular Monopoly game, there is a Hasidic version with Hasidic values. You see a lot of that from apple to apple, to Candyland. This is Candyland and instead of Candyland it's Mitzvahland, the Good Deed Land. All of these have religious implications. They have implications on the childhood environment, on the messaging for the child and the values for the child, but they also have extremely important economic implications in that it allows small local manufacturers to earn a living off of creating these entertainments. Here we have a selection of mp3 players that are part of the modified tech industry. These are kosher. They are modified so that you can't have internet on them. The cameras are also usually kosher. This is a kosher camera. It's been modified so that you can go online. So because the internet is seen as such a great evil and um, smartphones have been such a front for the religious uh, war, uh, the, the in industry responded to the banning of a lot of technology by creating modified technology that doesn't allow you to have access to what's seen as bad, like to the big World Wide Web, but still allows you to benefit from the technology by having your your music on a small little handy mp3 player instead of carrying around a giant boombox or the sony uh, walkman that we had 30 years ago so these are responses that allow for a tech niche to exist here and quite a few people are creating these techs and it is extremely busy whenever school is out the little kids come here and fidget around with the tech as if it's in an apple store because it's so exciting to try different pieces of technology but again they are all locally uh, modified they've, they've been they've been amended for the community's needs they're all in yiddish and this is about hanukkah they're very often about learning to, for the children's books, to learn to better yourself, interpersonal relationships. This book is about my sister is a bride, my sister is engaged, which is a very pronounced part of childhood with so many children in the family. The, a big part of the highlight of life is the anticipation of an older sibling getting married. So this is a story here. I'm sure the story has a lesson for the child to improve itself. But morality lessons as well as the story of the Bible, the biblical narrative, are also very big. Every day there are new books. Every day there are more areas for comics and different modes of storytelling. Oftentimes they're ripped off from the outside, but they are able to do that because outside books will not sell here. Only those which have Yiddish and a guise of a morality value, or at least a guise. <laughs> they don't always necessarily, um, they're not always as kosher, not all are equally kosher. This is a Judaica store that sells a lot of the accessories for men's religious clothing for their worship, like the bag in which they carry the phylacteries for prayers. 
There's a lot of things like those bags have over the years changed in fashion. They've become more sleek, less glamorously diamondy, and more modern. Um, as well as the covers for the challah bread, which is blessed at the Shabbos table every Friday night and Saturday morning. Those two have been undergoing different trends and fashions within the community over the years. A fun small little niche in this community is embroidery, which used to be done by hand and then it was a pretty serious industry. But embroidery is still very important even though it's done by machine now because you need to embroider almost all of the men's accessories because they're mostly black, they look very alike, all the men are in the synagogue and you never find your hat and your suit and your jacket and your winter coat and your phylactery case if it didn't have your name on it. So the men's Accessories will have on it with different fonts embroidered the name of the owner and make sure that it doesn't get mixed up. These are the gartels for the men, the belts, and they're, they're more expensive versions and cheaper versions. They're handmade and then they're machine made. Are these all? What's handmade? This handmade? This is made by hand? Yeah. Entirely? This is made by Really? Wow. This is beautiful. It goes on there's no talus here. It goes on the men's the men's talus that the men wear to pray, which is like a, a it's like a, a yellowish sheet made of real wool. It's a very uh, difficult to wash, that's how I think of it, a piece of article of clothing for the men, and it has um, what's called an atura on it, and this is made of real silver. So these are very expensive pieces that might be contrasted without with people buying maybe something that's a little more gaudy and that's not necessarily as ostentatious. Uh, the, man, the gentleman in the shop asked, was saying to the others in Yiddish, I hope she's not making fun of us. And that's what I was responding to, was saying, no, we're not making fun. Because, you know, he's, you know, people here are very, very reluctant to have outsiders come in, but also their ability to speak to each other in Yiddish and have sort of a secret way of communicating, which of course I can penetrate because I grew up in this world, but uh, generally, usually they're very comfortable knowing that no one can understand what they are talking to each other. It's actually a very useful tool in, in going around the world in business and knowing that you can talk to each other without anyone else understanding. It's sort of a vortex in this, in this private little public space because you have the secret language, uh, which is Yiddish, the spoken language in the community here. Babies outside of shops, unsupervised, are pretty much a relic of the past. Except in this community, the children are always, all the time you see children left outside or are in the front of the shop while the parent is in the inside. And the reason that people feel comfortable leaving their children on their own in the community here is because there's the safety, this sense of trust. And that sense of trust is another aspect of, of what builds a comfort with each other, a kind of preference to work with each other economically over outsiders. It, it's a feeling of we can trust each other and therefore we can, we can exchange, uh, we can have preferential economic exchanges. Judaica. See this shop is all men. There are only men in here because it sells special books that are in Hebrew. They're not in Yiddish, they're not in the first language. They're in Hebrew, they're religious texts, and the men are the ones who study those texts. So this shop is like a library for men that men will always come into and sort of browse the books. There's a bakery, and the bakeries sell, of course, kosher food for the religious life, including challah, which is the bread you eat on Shabbos. You can only find it here, pro tip, Thursday, late Thursday until Friday midday. And there are a lot of other delicious things. You, you gotta come to the bakery to get the bread. The Hasidic version of the challah bread, of the Jewish bread for Shabbos is very fluffy. It's very, it's a very yeasty bread. Um, and then we have all of the pastries 
that are kosher. They're arugula, which is, the arugula is like a staple here, or something you might nibble on. All right, you ready to shop, Becca? We're buying clothing. Um, here we're shopping, well, looking at all sorts of modest clothing for women, uh, which there are going to be more dressy ones for the weekend and more dressed down ones for the home. These are the cheap ones on the outside. And they're always going to have a closed neck the sleeves have to come to the wrist. The skirt needs to come mid-calf, except on the weekend when it could be sort of a gown all the way to the floor. That's just the outfit. The women also have a lot of needs around their head coverings when they get married, the wigs, the hats on top of them, the special stockings, the special shoes, which are usually regular shoes, but conservative selection that are sold in the shops here. To the jewelry, to the makeup, all of it has a little bit of a, a Hasidic twist that will be sold down along the avenue here. Okay, let's see if we can go inside. Dressy dresses. Oh, there's a dressy dress. Here we have a lot of uh, fancier tops. I'm not seeing anything I would buy. Right here. On the rack. There's a dress that might have been made. Some of the dresses um, are, are imported European companies and they're often afterwards modified to make them modest. So if maybe the sleeves are short, you put something under it to cover the arm. But oftentimes there's also companies that are specifically serving the community and selling even undergarments that are specific to what's typically worn here. I think this this is okay. This is nothing this this is not a high end shop that we're in. Very conservative colors. Very, very conservative colors generally. You wear very few bright colors, especially once the woman is older or especially once she's married. This might be a two-piece for a gown at a wedding. There's a lot of weddings because there's a lot of children that get married at a young age. So the wedding paraphernalia from the ballroom to the catering to the many, many outfits worn for the wedding, those are also a very big industry. We're in the kosher uh, alcoholic beverages shop and uh, there's a lot of wine and vodka and this is this is an example of kosher slivovitz plum brandy. Um, a lot of these have, this is old Williamsburg, look at that. Um, I, I have not been able to figure out what here is kosher and what is not because there's a lot of what seems to be regular stuff being sold. I know the wine needs to be kosher but it's the and the depth of my knowledge. When there's a special occasion, like an engagement, um, it will often be celebrated by doing the l'chaim, clinking of glasses with maybe some brandy or um, whatever other alcoholic beverage. So um, alcohol is, is a very big part of the ceremonial life. How do you feel about being on my film? Yeah, but that was a French thing. It wasn't for me. But I can't read Yiddish. I can't understand any English. Good, I can't even speak Yiddish. Yeah, it's it's much. <laughs> Did you grow up here? No, you told us last time you were born in France. I was born in Italy. Italy, Italy. So, so how come you weren't pushed out by Home Depot? Do you have a theory on that? On what? How come this this is a hardware store, yes. right? No, this is more than a hardware store. This is has everything. This is hardware, houseware. What's houseware? What do you mean? Houseware. By? We have dishes. We have uh, flatware for the house. 
Then we have plumbing. We have electronics. What are we, you? Have, we have things, we have merchandise that nobody has. Even Home Depot doesn't have a, a such a variety what we have. Over. Like what? Uh, like fuses. There is fuses that they use for, all, for the old houses, you know, the fuses that you uh, turn in or you twist. Not like, not breakers. The new houses, everybody has breakers. Right, right, breaking. I see. But if somebody needs something and they don't have it, they don't carry it anymore, they ask the owner, other stores, where can I find it still? Go to it's here. Stuff. Try to stuff. I see. So, you also have Shabbos, I guess. Shabbos, I guess, yes. Which, uh, can you tell us what Shabbos, I guess are? Shabbos, I guess is, we have something like this. This is a Shabbos, I guess, that you put onto the switch and you have to adjust it when you want the light to go off, Shabbos, and when the light goes on. This doesn't need any electric, no nothing, no installation, just you have to put it on. Then we have Shabbos I guess that you have, you have to install. Instead of a switch, you have to take out the switch and put in the Shabbos So it's permanent? Yes, yes, but you could use it in, in the weekdays. There's a switch, a separate switch to make it so, on and off. Yeah. Are these made by, by Jewish companies? No. No, they're no. just other, they're just yeah. adapted. Do you have a, uh, do you toivel here? Yes, we do. Can we see it? You want me to go into the mikvah or uh, you want yeah, to yeah, see you. Okay, so. <laughs> you go into, you have a bathing suit? Yes. <laughs> the mikvah is in aisle A. Go, I like. take him over there. Ah, here. <laughs> it's very small. Good thing he decided not to come into the... <laughs> um, this is a little pool of well water where you have to dunk your dishes before they can be used. They have to be purified. It's called uh, a mikvah that you have to toivel, you have to rinse um, everything that I, I believe maybe ceramic. I, I'm out of my depth on what it is. I believe glasses wear before you can use it. So this is here on the premises. If you buy a set of dishes, you can dunk it right away and then go and use it instead of if you buy it at uh, Bed Bath & Beyond and you're Hasidic, you now have a problem of finding a place to make it kosher and ready for use. Do you hear this? This by some mig dash da da da. This is a Hasidic music, which of course is a huge industry in its own because you're not allowed to hear women or secular music is not allowed. So there's all of the locally produced music. This, this sounds very klezmer to me, but maybe it's a newer style. It's constantly new fashions around the music. We're going to the restaurant, kosher. Hello. This is a dairy restaurant. They don't serve anything with meat, but a lot of dairy stuff. The restaurants here are divided into categories. It's meat or dairy. It's not uh, Chinese or Japanese. In fact, a lot of the dairy restaurants also sell sushi. I wouldn't be surprised if there was sushi here. Um, uh, pretty much all of the restaurants divide themselves in these two categories, again, because of kosher. So we have really delicious stuff here, including rakat krampli, which is a Hungarian dish that most people I know don't know what it is. Um, so I'm happy to see that here. But this is, this is the menu that is very typical for the dairy restaurants. This behind me is a boys' school. And this boys' school is only for boys age 2 to 13. And boys' schools like this are all over this community. There are also schools for age 13 until marriage for boys. And then there are schools specifically for the girls. So these educational institutions for these children are staffed and they are growing all the time because of the birth rate by members from the community only. So you don't have to have a teacher certification. You just need to be a member from the community to have a teaching opportunity, a secretarial, a principal position, a leadership position, or in any of the many, many roles of educating the members of this community.
This is the home of the Southmore Grand Rabbi Zalman Teitelbaum. They're two brothers that are feuding and this is one of their homes. There are quite a few religious leaders in the community, Grand Rabbis, uh, religious legal experts, judges. There are There's a whole staff to the religious court here. All of these are positions within the synagogue and the religious home that are paid that are um, either salaried or you get paid in various avenues of creating of, of supporting the religious and educational function of the community so it is not only our schools that are segregated and the teaching positions there there's a whole lot of additional jobs in educating the bride and the groom in being a staff in the rabbinic home that um, make up the religious educational aspect of the economy here.